one of the guys who was running uh, Fort Smith, a guy called Pukis, uh, took it upon himself to confront Wayaki. They got into a fight. Um, Wayaki did overcome this uh, uh, rather weak uh, Mzungu fella called Pukis. He was going to dispatch him to the next wall. <laughs> My name is uh, Njoroge Regero. Uh, professionally, I'm a lawyer. I'm a practicing advocate. Uh, on the side, uh, I have side interests, and part of those have included researching and writing the book uh, that brings us here today. This is uh, Modamaki Oyakiwahinga, a book that uh, traces the roots of this patriarch. He was a leader amongst his people. He was recognized for his bravery, for his leadership, and for the sheer audacity that he exhibited in confronting the colonialists very early on, at a time when, in fact, there was no movement to try and seat uh, the colonialists who are uh, wreaking havoc in the country. And Oyeki, from amongst so many hundreds and thousands of people, came to the forefront. He was recognized. Uh, by his people, his peers. Yeah, he was made uh, a leader amongst them, and he championed and spearheaded the struggle. Mudamaki Yaki Wahinga is actually the pioneer freedom fighter. If you look at the years uh, when he operated, leading up to his death uh, in 1892, 6th of September 1892 is when he died, then you can see he was ahead of his time. Uh, you have had some other exemplary leaders and freedom fighters like Dead and Kemadi, but those came much, much, much later. I mean, uh, Kemadi, without meaning to take anything from him, uh, was tiring and uh, doing great things say, during the Mau Mau era in the 50s, but you can see Oyeki had featured much, much earlier, and he was therefore a pioneer freedom fighter. He ignited in many ways the flame that sparked and led to the rebellion that culminated in the 1950s in the Mau Mau movement uh, that drove away the white man from our lands. Uh, from the very first chapters, uh, we trace his origins and how he even landed here in the first place. And it is true that he had emigrated from Maasai land uh, with his uh, and this is now I'm talking about his father because we have to trace back to uh, to Oyaki's father. This is Hinga. Hinga had uh, emigrated from a island at a time when uh, he was a wanted man. Uh, in a confrontation with a certain Maasai man, he had uh, killed him, and the community there was up in arms against him. And his mother grabbed him and said, look, we better run for dear life. And um, they set out uh, to come to, this is in the 1820s, uh, 1830s, to come to Kikuyu land to take refuge. And uh, they came to the Gadecha family, which hosted him and adopted him. And with time, he started expanding. This is Hinga Wayaki. Uh, and with his many wives, he then started procreating. And uh, that is where, from amongst his many sons, uh, you had uh, this bright spark. Oyaki, who would then become uh, subsequently the, the leader of these people, who would become Modamaki and lead his people to rebellion and eventually uh, to confront uh, the white man. The IBA, and we have dealt with it quite a bit in our book, found uh, a person who was well entrenched in leadership amongst his people, uh, well respected, and who was looked upon by his people for guidance and direction in many ways. So as these people, remember the IBA was largely a trading outfit that uh, moved goods and uh, merchandise from the coast across and to neighboring countries, Uganda and so on. And they needed outposts as they traversed through this region. And uh, in our region, the region that is under consideration in this book, uh, Oyaki was king. Oyaki ruled the terrain. So if you wanted peace, if you wanted security, 
if you wanted safe passage, then the man to talk to was Wayeki, and invariably uh, you had to talk to him and get to, to, to get to some kind of pacts with him. Uh, that is why, for instance, you have um, Oyaki getting into a pact, the friendship pact uh, with Lugard uh, at some point where there was going to be mutual recognition and mutual respect. You do your thing, I do my thing. And uh, these Wazungus obviously needed that kind of protection because in terms of numbers, they were hugely outnumbered. Uh, of course, they had sophisticated arms and so on, but uh, you did need uh, that kind of support. And Oyeki did provide it, and he expected reciprocity, he expected mutual respect. Um, Unfortunately, this didn't happen, and that is how you found that subsequently there were confrontations uh, that led into disastrous results. That pact did not last for very long. And from all accounts, it would appear that uh, Lug had uh, dishonored this pact. Uh, Oyeki expected, so did his people, that they would be treated with respect, they would be allowed to carry on with their established traditional way of life and so on. But the Muzungu had other thoughts. They, they started encroaching on uh, our values, uh, our traditions. Uh, they started harassing our beautiful girls and so on. And Oyeki wouldn't have any of this. Uh, so even the warriors wouldn't have any of this. And it is not surprising, therefore, that that pact very quickly degenerated. When you consider that uh, there was a falling out uh, in parts such as this, in the relationships between local leaders like Wayeki and others, invariably this had to lead to violence. You had it in the blockade, you had it in the Lari massacre and things like those. Uh, and this was the Muzungu in desperation trying to assert now his control through force. <laughs> because obviously he had superior firepower in terms of ammunition and so on, uh, which we didn't have. Well, what he had encountered on was the determination, the sheer determination and spirit of our people to resist and to rise and to assert their land, uh, to, to assert their interests, particularly as far as land was concerned. It was always a very touchy subject. And uh, they, they, they felt that uh, you know, they were prepared to lay down their lives to protect their land. So when the history of uh, freedom struggle and the liberation movement is written, the blockade has to feature prominently. Uh, another incident that uh, I have documented in this book, these are the milestones, these are the building blocks uh, uh, upon which uh, the struggle was uh, erected, was built, and eventually we, we realized our freedom. Fort Smith uh, is central in this book. In fact, if you look at the cover, the building you see right at the cover is the Fort Smith building uh, in a place called Fort Smith, not too far from here. Do Boine on your way to Getaro, that is where you have Fort Smith. And you know, it is a shame that so many decades after our independence, the place is still called Fort Smith because of Major Eric Smith uh, who established it. And again, it was an outpost uh, by the Wazungus. It was meant to be a place. Uh, the, the word fort, as you might uh, appreciate, uh, connotes some, some kind of uh, security hold, doesn't it? It is a fort which should afford you protection and security, where you can put your merchandise and be safe and secure and so on. So this guy, um, um, Smith, uh, put it up there with his people. Uh, by the way, he was one armed. He didn't have one hand, uh, so he was christened Yekorno, uh, meaning one-handed guy. And the whole point was to operate from Fort Smith, use it as a point of influence and protection from his people, and from there, of course, try to dictate things uh, from uh, to the people around there. And because it was uh, smack in the heartland of Kikuyu land, then it meant that it was right in the in Waiyaki's staff. Uh, it was in his neighborhood, and so you had to, to deal with him. And uh, initially, from all accounts, the, the relationship was uh, cordial. They were getting along very well and so on, but something went disastrously wrong at some point, and one of the guys who was running uh, Fort Smith, a guy called Pukis, uh, took it upon himself to confront Waiyaki, uh, there are different versions of what happened, but the end result is that uh, they got into a struggle. 
they got into a fight. Um, Wayaki did overcome this uh, uh, rather weak uh, Muzungu fella called Pukis. He was going to dispatch him to the next world. But his guards came and wrestled Wayaki down. Uh, they held him overnight uh, at uh, the fort. And in fact, that uh, Fort Smith had within the compound what you might call a cell, a prison cell where they used to incarcerate people uh, overnight uh, and uh, torture them and do all sorts of things to them. And there was also an outhouse that was used as a courtroom. Uh, in fact, when we visited this place for the first time uh, in 2014, we christened that place uh, The Hague because that room reminded you very much of what was going on uh, uh, at The Hague. And so Wayaki was tied to uh, a lamppost, a tree, uh, outside the fort overnight. And he was then subjected to what you could call a kangaroo court, uh, where he was uh, tried, if we can call that uh, a trial. And eventually, they found him guilty. And the sentence that was uh, meted out to him was that he should be deported, he should be banished from that area and shipped down to, to the coast somewhere. And that is how the trek from Fort, Fort Smith uh, to Kibwezi started. And the uh, story goes that then um, when he got to Kibwezi, they decided to, oh, to actually kill him. And the story goes that uh, Wayeki was actually buried alive upside down at Kibwezi. Uh, there are all sorts of folklore stories and uh, songs that were then uh, that people have been singing over the years. Um, but again, in fairness, you also have conflicting stories. Some, some say, no, he was shot. Then they buried him there. Uh, others say, no, he got very seriously ill on his way to Kibwezi, had very se severe diarrhea and so on. It overcame him, he died. But the long and short of it, and this is common ground, is that he died and was buried uh, at Kibwezi. Uh, and so you can see uh, the connection, the very central role that Fort Smith did play in Wayaki's uh, life, particularly at this later stage, when now the Muzungu decided that they needed to get rid of him. He was probably far too influential, uh, far too daring, far too brave for them, uh, and they needed to contain him before this fire spread, uh, and as indeed it did much later when Mau Mau really took root uh, in our land. The, the rise and eventual fall of Wayaki did, did uh, trigger uh, a wave of uh, a generation of other leaders who came up, and they felt that they had to carry on the struggle. Uh, Wayaki had started it. It snowballed into other people who came up, and they took up uh, the call. And that is why eventually it seemed to acquire a life of its own, uh, leading to the Mau Mau Rebellion as we know it. Despite the tremendous uh, sacrifices that were made by him, and even the larger family, that uh, in terms of recognition, there is hardly anything at all. There is reason for us to pause and reflect and look back and see, have we done right? Have we been fair and just to those those tall ones, those warriors who championed the struggle, who are very selfless in this, who are very brave. I mean, look at what they had to come up against, rudimentary weapons, uh, against uh, pretty sophisticated weapons by these Mzungus, uh, their communities being um, interfered with, being molested, being... You know, it was a horrendous situation. And you know, you didn't have say, some national force or anything behind these tribal leaders. They had to improvise and do it uh, themselves and carry on the struggle and hope that somehow uh, it ends up in a good place. It did eventually, but at horrible, horrible cost to them and their families. And I think the very least that anybody would expect is that there is due recognition of efforts such as this. Fort Smith, you cannot talk about Oyaki and not talk about Fort Smith. Uh, and uh, to, to the credit of uh, the government, back in 2005, 
that site was actually gazetted as a national monument. So this uh, building that you see on the cover of my book is by dint of that Gazette notice supposed to be a national monument preserved for posterity and so on. But the reality on the ground is that the place is in a shambles. It is dilapidated, nobody minds it. We need to resist this uh, idea of tokenism, that you think that it is sufficient to just Gazette Fort Smith. That should only be the beginning. You must go a bit further and secure the place, give a vote for the maintenance of that place, and then breathe life into it by, for instance, making it a museum uh, where you can have a collection of things, Yaki, where you can have a collection of things to do with the community, uh, the, the grouping there. And it can be a serious attraction, not only for local tourism where people want to see and trace their roots, uh, but even for uh, tourism generally. Secondly, the site where Mudamaki Weyaki Wahinga was buried in Kibwezi. As I said, it is common ground that he was actually bur buried in Kibwezi. How he died may be in contest, was he buried upside down alive? Was he poisoned? Did he die of diarrhea and so on? But the consensus is that he was buried there 1892. Now, it beats, it beats logic why it is not possible, given state machinery and so on, to trace a gravesite such as this. Look at the dead and Kemadi story. I mean, for how many years have we had you know, this relentless search for a grave that does not seem to yield any results? Um, if there is political will, I believe it is possible to establish uh, where the grave is, and that becomes a shrine, it becomes a site that can be preserved again as a national monument in celebration of those people who went uh, ahead of us, those people who laid down their lives. Uh, for the sake of this country. Uh, the fact that a site like that continues to be neglected must mean that we couldn't care less, we are not bothered. Uh, it should prick our national conscience uh, that we let these sites uh, fall by the wayside and do nothing about it, okay? Another site I could mention uh, based uh, somewhere in Kikuyu near Karura Kanyogo is uh, a place that was called Gururumoyahiga. Hinga's waterfalls. This is where uh, Hinga now uh, used to go and uh, bathe and spend time, and it was associated with him. It bears his name. Uh, we have visited it and seen it. It's a very scenic place uh, with the waterfalls, and it is so easy to preserve something like that. Uh, finally, uh, the Wayaki's story cannot be divorced from the mission area in the Goto. The Goto is really a corruption of the word Scottish. Scotland, our people couldn't quite pronounce Scottish, so they called it the Goto. And the Goto is uh, the genesis of a lot of uh, good things in terms of uh, Christianity, education, the Alliance uh, High School, Alliance Girls, uh, the hospital there. And you have some great buildings there that uh, have come up over the years. You have the Church of the Torch that was put up 1928 uh, to 1933. Uh, you have the uh, Watson uh, Memorial Chapel, uh, 1909. Those, those are edifices, those are structures that cannot be divorced from uh, Wayaki's uh, uh, lifeline and uh, Wayaki's uh, struggles, Wayaki's family, and they need to be preserved as such. We are not saying that they be personalized to him, of course, but every time that those are preserved and you keep talking about them, you take us back to those good old days when people really used to struggle and uh, make sacrifices for the common good. As a country, when we can identify these gallant sons and daughters of the land, who have over time sacrificed so much, whether it is the Wayakis, the, the Kemadis, the Matibas, the Rubias, the Shikuku, you name them, then the very least we can do as a country 
is the proper thing to do, is the right thing to do, is the decent thing to do, is to recognize them. The converse then is true that if we do not uh, honor them and recognize and celebrate them, then we are not, we are being indecent, we are being improper, and you know, that kind of indecency can then even be seen in other spheres of our national life. It means then that even in our dealings with the national economy, national politics, we are then indecent, we are not playing fair, we are not decent. It is reflective of a community, the way you deal with your heroes. And you know, I have given all sorts of citations here and what historians have said about uh, uh, people and communities that do not recognize their heroes. Abraham Lincoln said that a nation that does not recognize its heroes does not long endure. And President John F. Kennedy said that a nation reviews itself not only by men it produces, but also by the men it honors, the men it remembers. So recognition or non-recognition of the people who have been heroes and stalwarts ahead of us actually is a mirror of the, on the kind of community that you are dealing with.